Hello, you're joining the third of our podcasts on rare diseases, and more specifically on Fabry disease. This time, we are at the nephrology department of the Jan Ipermann Hospital in Ypres. And for a change, we will talk with two experts instead of one. They will have a discussion on the early detection and the treatment of Fabry disease. And as always, our host is Katrin van Elk. I am looking forward to meeting Dr. Wim Terin, who is a nephrologist here at Jan Ipperman, and Dr. Gerte Schoenmaker, a nephrologist at AZ Delta in Rooselare. Both physicians have a special interest in Fabry disease and are very committed to early diagnose patients. Dr. Terin has done research on Fabry disease and also obtained a PhD in this field. And Dr. De Schoenmaker is strongly interested in rare diseases and actively screens his patient population for Fabry disease. The format of this episode is a discussion between a Fabry specialist and a nephrologist who is not entirely convinced of the added value of screening for Fabry. Good afternoon, Dr. Terin. Uh, hello, Katrien. Welcome in the Jan Ipperman Hospital. Thank you. And Dr. De Schoenmaker. Welcome to. Thank you for your engagement recording this podcast, in which we want to explain to your fellow nephrologists why they are important in the diagnostic process of patients with Fabry disease. So, Dr. Terin, can you tell us exactly what Fabry is? Yes, Katrin. So Fabry disease is a lysosomal storage disease, and more specifically, it's a sphingolipidosis. This means it is a disease that is caused by the accumulation of GB3, a glycosphingolipid, which accumulates in the lysosomes of all cells of the body. Glycosphingolipids, these are lipids with a carbohydrate group, which are part of, of the cell membrane, and they have a role in signaling and in cell-cell interactions. GB3 is a glycosphingolipid uh, named globotriacylceramide, which is metabolized by the alpha-galactosidase A enzyme. And um, the problem in Fabry disease is that this enzyme is deficient, with a result that GB3 is not metabolized and is being accumulated in the cells. And the cells, uh, because of this accumulation, go into apoptosis. The symptoms of Fabry disease can begin in childhood. It can begin with non-specific symptoms, uh, with GI problems in children. But the symptoms can be more specific. Fabry children can have problems with sweating. They have anhydrosis, and as a result, they have difficulty to participate in physical activities, like in sport. And uh, Fabry patients can also have uh, acroparesthesia. This means they have painful extremities. Later on, Fabry patients in adulthood get classical symptoms like proteinuria, chronic kidney failure, stroke, and cardiac problems with uh, arrhythmia, left ventricular hypertrophy, and chronotropic incompetence. Sometimes they get pacemakers because of this. There's a difference between classical Fabry disease uh, and then we have variants. Some variant Fabry patients only have cardiac problems or uh, pre predominantly have cardiac problems or nephrological problems or have only have stroke. And next to the classical Fabry patients, we have also the attenuated phenotypes where enzyme deficiency is uh, less severe and these patients can have uh, several of the symptoms I have been describing. Okay, Wim, um, given that Fabry is such a rare disease, is it uh, really worthwhile looking for those patients in my daily practice as a nephrologist? I can imagine that the chance I, I find patients like that are very uh, low. Yes, it's, it's a rare disease. Um, Fabry disease is not prevalent. Classical Fabry disease is not, is not more prevalent than 1 in 40,000. But um, you have to know, making a diagnosis is very important because it's a genetic disease, it is X-linked, so it can be transmitted um, in an X-linked way. And 
Having the diagnosis is also important for the patients because sometimes they have been looking for a diagnosis for years. And next there is the treatment for Fabry disease. So especially the treatment is effective if it is started at an early stage of the disease. So these are several good reasons to make the diagnosis, even if the diagnosis is not very um, probable. And then you have to know to screen for Fabry disease is really easy. It is not invasive, it is not uh, expensive. It is uh, easy for every clinician, every nephrologist in, in, in every practice. Yeah, but can I narrow down the group of patients that I have to screen or look for uh, Fabry disease in these patients? Because it's hard to imagine that I start looking for Fabry disease in all the patients I see in my daily practice. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> I think you, of course, you don't have to screen for Fabry disease when you have a good other diagnosis. So if you do a biopsy, and probably you do biopsies in, in many of your patients, a kidney biopsy can give you a specific di diagnosis. Or you can have another genetic diagnosis, but I think in all the other cases, it is worth doing uh, the screening for Fabry disease because it, Fabry disease can be difficult to diagnose because stroke, uh, proteinuria, left ventricular hypertrophy are not specific symptoms and they can occur in many uh, uh, patients with kidney disease and, and sometimes they are ascribed to hypertension or diabetes mellitus, which are very prevalent. But if you think that way, we will miss these, uh, these patients. And the problem with rare diseases is that they are underdiagnosed. So if you don't screen for them, you will not find them and we will not know them. So what you are saying, in fact, is that uh, even if the patient doesn't have any other organ systems involved, uh, only like renal insufficiency and proteinuria, that is even worth uh, screening uh, that patient. I think, yes, if you have uh, only proteinuria, or you have renal insufficiency, these are reasons enough to screen for Fabry disease. But of course, you can, you, if you screen, you can, do, you can screen for other genetic diseases too. And how is, does that go in practice? How do we do that in practice? Well, the, the diagnosis of Fabry disease composes uh, largely on, on two elements. First, there's the enzyme uh, activity. You can measure enzyme activity uh, in the blood. So this is alpha-galactosidase A activity. And in male, um, this is a good test for Fabry disease. If the enzyme activity is normal, Fabry disease can be excluded. In female, the diagnosis is somehow much more difficult because, as it is an X-linked disease, uh, there can be a residual enzyme function. So if you do an enzyme test in female, in the blood, the enzyme function can be normal or can be uh, somehow a bit low, but it is not really diagnostic and it uh, cannot exclude the diagnosis. So in female, you only always have to do a genetic test, which is a sequencing of the gene coding for the enzyme, and this gene calls the GLA. Yeah, so and if the patient comes to my office and uh, I examine the patient and then um, there is no family history of Fabry disease, should I be even then aware of the, the fact that it is possible that the patient has Fabry? Yes, why? Because first uh, you can have a de novo mutation. There's a lot of families described who have no Fabry disease uh, in, in the parents and uh, the patient can be a de novo uh, patient. But, but on the other hand, uh, this is, as the disease is X-linked, the female siblings can be asymptomatic. They can be carriers, but is asymptomatic. So uh, negative family history is not really an exclusion for testing. So thank you for these interesting insights from which we learned more about the symptomatology and the prevalence of this rare disease, but also why it is worth looking for fabric patients. You listen to the first part of this podcast. If you're eager to learn more about testing for Fabry and how nephrologists can do that in the daily practice, well, then you cannot miss the second part of the discussion with Dr. Tedin and Dr. De Schoonmarkere.